Okay, so I think I will let everyone in from the waiting room. We are going to lecture on cancer, like I said. Now, cancer is one of those things where you um, unfortunately may have experienced it. And this hits pretty close to home for most. Um, you know somebody who's gone through it or your friends have had a family member go through it. And so it's, it's really not the, it's not like really like a fun thing to talk about, but we need to understand why cancer happens and it happens often, right? Now, a little background. What we've been discussing all week is the cell cycle. So we now know our little hand gestures is that when we are going through the cell cycle, we're gonna have three main stages, interface, mitosis, cytokinesis. And now we know each individual subphase. So in interphase, we know we have um, G1, S, and G2. And mitosis, we know we have PMAP, right? And now we can actually describe this by using our hands. So when we go through the cell cycle, we start off with one cell. Now the cell gets activated in the cell cycle when we are either growing or repairing cells. And so the first step is G1. G means we grow. Next step is S, synthesis. We make, we're making a copy of the DNA, replication. Step three, G2 which is checking for error and we finish growth. Um, once we're finished with interphase, which is the longest phase of the cell cycle. Now I told you why is interphase the longest phase of the cell cycle? Because growing takes a long time. With the growth, right? Once we finish that, it takes about almost three quarters of the entire time that we spend in the cell cycle. We enter mitosis, which we remember using PMAP. P is prophase. This is the first step of mitosis. And we're gonna dissolve the nucleus so that we can expose the chromosomes. The chromosomes look like little X's. Um, the next step is M, metaphase. We line up in the middle. So all of our centromeres, which are your knuckles here, are gonna line up in the middle. Next up is anaphase. A is apart. The last step of mitosis is going to be telophase, which is going to remember your little binoculars. You're gonna see the cleavage furrow, you're gonna see the nuclear membrane reform, and we're going to get ready for the cell division, which happens in cytokinesis. End result is two identical daughter cells. Now, because there is some sort of stop and go mechanism that triggers the cell cycle to turn on and off, we have a lot of interest in trying to figure out what that is, because if we are able to stop the cell cycle, then we are able to tell cancer cells to stop dividing. And so we could essentially cure cancer if we were able to control it. The cell cycle, like I said, is typically triggered by growth and or trauma. And so potential injuries are when you cut your skin or you break a bone, et cetera. Now, the cells, when you first get injured, are going to divide very, very rapidly. And if you've ever had like a large cut on your arm, you'll have like a nice looking scab on top of it, right? The scab is there to prevent any type of infection. So scarring is an evolutionary mechanism that we've developed over time to help us from dying due to a potential foreign pathogen entering our body, right? So we have a cut. The, you have to try to visualize a cut healing like an inward spiral. So first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna go all around the perimeter of whatever has been injured. And it's going to very, very rapidly divide so that it can heal the outside. And then it's going to start to spiral its way in. And eventually once it starts getting to the middle, it's going to start to slow down because it only wants to make the number of cells needed for it to be healed. If you've ever had a scab that's been on there for more than a couple of days, the scab starts to dry up and it gets to be actually quite itchy. You will typically pick at your little scab or it'll lift off of your skin and you'll be able to tell that the skin underneath it looks like it's ready to go. The boys love picking their scabs. And unfortunately, once you pick a scab prematurely, what happens to your cut? You start bleeding again. And it's typically, again, like I said, right at the middle of the cut. And the reason that this happens is because it's working its way inward. As it's getting towards the middle, it starts to slow down because it doesn't want to make any extra cells that are not needed. So that is why those scabs seem to take forever to heal. That, and you're like, man, I've had this thing forever. How is it not like 
back to normal. And that's because it slows down intentionally. Now the discovery of cyclins. Biologists are basically trying to, like I said, figure out the stop and go mechanism that regulates the cell cycle. If we're able to regulate it, we're able to turn it on and off. Well, there are these proteins called cyclins that allow the cell cycle to move on in stages. And I like to think about them like when their people are shifting gears when they drive a standard transmission, right? It's like as soon as we um, get through G1 and we finish all of our growth, boom, we shift into the next gear. We go into synthesis. As soon as we get everything that we need for synthesis, boom, shift into the next gear. We go into G2, right? And so this is what allows us to move between our phases. And so again, if we are able to figure out these cyclins, these stop and goes that um, allow the next step to take place, then it essentially it would put us closer to trying to get these cancerous cells to stop. Now, when you break a bone or you cut your skin, the first instinct of the body is to really rapidly try to go in there and fix this. Um, when you have a break, oftentimes you'll have to make sure that the bones are set so that they grow back and they're straight. If you don't set this bone, it's going to make bone until it reaches the other side. And that's gonna make for a very brittle bone that's gonna be prone to breaking again. So that's why doctors will go in and sometimes put like screws and rods and whatever to make sure that those bones align with one another. When they're uh, healing, it's going to basically like heal in layers. So that side is going to heal, this side is going to heal. And it's going to just like put one layer on top of the next and it's working from both sides and eventually it wants to reach one another in the middle. As it's getting to the middle, it's again really, really slow because it only wants to make whatever is needed. Apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Essentially, the cell will self destruct. Apoptosis. Um, if it does not occur as it should, there's going to be some results that are not positive. An example of apoptosis occurring when it shouldn't is when we have cell loss that seems that's seen in AIDS and Parkinson's um, disease patients that can result in too much apoptosis. So we lose too many nerve cells or we lose the immune system right completely. But the thing is, is that apoptosis isn't just bad. It's actually quite good. It, it helps us in development. So here you'll see a picture of what essentially a mouse's foot looks like while it's being formed in gestation. So this is an embryonic foot. And ourselves, right, humans, originally your hand looked like a little oven mitt. And then there, as you started to develop your digits, you saw webbing in between each finger. Well, those cells were programmed to die. And that's what allows for range of motion between your digits. This also occurs in our toes. And you see a small remnant of that webbing in between each finger. It allows for certain structures um, in our body and in plants. Here you see it shaping our fingers, but you also see that the removal of tissue allows the frogs, so these are amphibians, to undergo this metamorphosis, right? To go from like tadpole to an actual frog. Um, cancer. Cancer is defined as uncontrolled cell growth. There is no longer um, a stop. We are just going full steam ahead and we're making cells that are no longer needed. These cells are going to begin to accumulate in clusters that we refer to as tumors. Not all tumors are cancerous. The best example that I can give you, and this is awful and I feel awful for giving it as an example, but I'm gonna just be transparent and honest. Phones are a big distraction when driving. They are. Um, sometimes um, as I'm driving, whether it be I'm trying to change the song, 
to get my kids to just like settle down and be quiet because Sterling has his very specific playlist that he likes to listen to. Or if I'm trying to call my husband so that I can uh, figure out what I'm gonna cook for dinner, whatever the case is. That phone in your hand can be a distraction. And sometimes, and I will say it, I am an autopilot and as I'm going home, you will sometimes miss a stop. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like did I just run through that stop sign? And I freak out, I panic, I put the phone away. I'm like driving with both hands, like white fist. I'm like freaking out and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to be careful, like this is gonna be bad. Why? Because I had a distraction. But the moment that I caught myself, it's like, okay, we're not gonna do that again. I'd like, we're done. Put the phone away, I'll just deal with it when I get home. This is exactly what happens with benign tumors. The cells got a little bit excited when they were making new cells and it didn't realize it missed the stop sign. But the moment that it catches and it's like, oh my gosh, we're supposed to stop back there. It doesn't make any more cells. And these little clusters or these little tumors, while well, yes, they are there and yes, some people can feel them. Typically when they get biops, they'll come back and they're benign, which means they're non-cancerous. These are not spreading, they're not affecting healthy cells, they're not making you sick, they're just there. Now, if a tumor is um, classified to be malignant, then this is now a cancerous tumor. And this tumor is going to essentially invade and start killing a lot of healthy cells. And the fact that healthy cells are dying is going to now basically going to start making you sick because those healthy cells are no longer able to do their job. And so you getting sick or you having symptoms is what leads you to the doctor and that's typically what leads to a diagnosis, right? Obviously we all know that cancerous tumors can be life-threatening. You can die from cancer if it goes untreated. The growth of cancer, let's look at what kind of the life of a cancer cell looks like. Here we have an abnormal cell. The cell has begun to grow and produce more of its cancerous cells. And so this now accumulates into a tumor. This tumor is going to start to displace the healthy cells surrounding it. And so it's gonna start putting pressure and it's gonna keep them from doing their job. Eventually this tumor is gonna to get to the point where it is going to be too big for that space and it's going to try to find a way to travel somewhere else. If cancer cells get into the bloodstream, since the blood goes anywhere, this cancer can essentially be deposited anywhere. And this is why you'll hear of like breast cancer that has now spread to like the brain or the hip or the lungs, et cetera, right? Uh, and this process is called metastasis. So that's why you'll hear about like metastatic breast cancer. That's cancer that has spread. Now, what causes cancer? I could sit here and tell you that cancer runs in my family, but truly it does not. And the fact of the matter is this, my mom's mom, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother has had breast cancer twice. My mother has had cervical cancer. So what does that tell you about me? I'm predisposed to getting cancer. You're ca yeah, you're cancer prone. Well, and here's the thing is that I did not inherit cancer, but I inherited crappy cells that are prone to breaking down and therefore um, developing cancer, okay? So again, you don't inherit cancer, but the reason that you see cancer running in families is because again, you get those defective genes that are prone to not following these stop mechanisms within the cell cycle and going haywire. Now, because of course I am aware of my family history, I am super cautious and we do a lot of preventative checkups to just make sure that I'm okay and everything's within margins just because of my family history, I'm a little more predisposed. Um, and so for me, it's just a matter of not living in denial, but rather just trying to be proactive because I have kids now. And of course I don't want to not be without my children. So, you know, it, the more, you know, 
but there are people, I have aunts that are in the completely flip side of that, who believe that they don't want to know anything, that it's all propaganda, that they're all going to die from something, and to each their own. But the fact of the matter is, is that you don't inherit cancer, you inherit defective genes. Now, there's also certain things that you can do to trigger cancer from happening, and these are lifestyle choices. Obviously, smoking, chewing tobacco has seen a decrease here lately, and it's kind of been replaced with vaping. Um, radiation exposure, viral infections are a big one that we're seeing as well. HPV is the human papavola virus, and it's actually one of the leading causes of cervical cancer. And this is something that's been more like within the past 10 years become, uh, it was sort of taboo to talk about HPV um, because, and, well, and I say unfortunately, but it's not unfortunate. It's the reality of it. it HPV is sexually transmitted virus. And because it's leading to cervical cancer, when all of this data came forward and women were being diagnosed with cervical cancer very early on, like when I'm talking about like mid thirties, late thirties, like this was unheard of before. So what happened is that they rolled out this vaccine, it's called the HPV vaccine. And they started vaccinating little girls, right? And I say little because they were trying to get them vaccinated before, before they were sexually active. And so around 11 and 12 years old, they were being vaccinated. Um, and it was like, okay, I think we put a Band-Aid on it. But what they didn't realize is what was spreading this virus. And so now they vaccinate both male and female. So 11 and 12 years, they vaccinate both the boys and the girls. And this has seen a decrease in those cervical cancer diagnosis, but the way that they went about it was like a true propaganda method where they were putting a lot of ethos in their commercials to try to motivate parents to vaccinate their kids because it's a three shot series. And I'll show you all the, the, the commercial because you guys have probably seen it, right? But this is like the cancer association's way of saying like, hey, like we need to try to prevent this from happening. Um, and then, like I said, defective genes right? Essentially, what it all boils down to is the cell cycles broken down, and this is how we ended up with cancer. Now, treatments for cancer. The most obvious is to go in there and cut it out. This is the most common type of treatment for skin cancer. Um, typically, these treatments aren't standalone. They're coupled with one another. Radiation is very effective because it has very targeted beams. So you'll see this in like brain, lung, um, ovarian, prostate. And then they'll typically couple it, like I said, they'll do like radiation and chemo or they'll do surgery and chemo or surgery and radiation um, because they're trying to go in there and be very aggressive to get rid of these cells because these cells themselves are very aggressive. Um, the only thing that people consider to be negative about chemo is the most common side effect is that patients lose their hair, right? Well, the fact of the matter is this. People don't realize how fast our hair grows, especially girls, like we're the worst. Like I go and get my hair trimmed every like three to six months. I don't do it as often as I should because I don't think about doing it. But like the boys, Larson, if you went six months without cutting your hair, how do you think you would look? it would get really shaggy, right? So let me tell you this, my brother, I have three younger brothers, the oldest of the three, Juan is about to turn 28. And that guy is OCD about his hair. Every Wednesday he's at the barber. And he's literally been doing this as old, like as we we're probably in high school when he started doing it. And like, as soon as he got a job and he started driving, he would go and get a haircut once a week. And I'm like, why? Well, when the pandemic started and everything was shut down, he like, I, I probably saw him and it was like two weeks in or three weeks in. And I was like, bro, you look homeless because I had never seen my brother without like a clean cut. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's only been like a week and you already look like you've been like homeless for six months. Like, how is this happening? 
Um, my husband, if he goes the weekend without, like, well, now he has a beard because that's his look. But before when we got married, he was always really clean shaven. And so if he would go like from Friday to Monday morning, I'm like, oh, like shave already. Like, you know, you have like this weird beard going on. Um, the girls during the summer, they don't like having to shave their legs all the time because they're wearing shorts, they're going to the pool. It's the same about like the boys with the mustaches because the football coaches make them shave or you're shaving your armpits, whatever. Hair grows fast and you're not conscious of it unless you're trying to get rid of it. And with chemo, chemo is targeting cells that divide very, very rapidly. And so it's targeting those cancer cells, but inadvertently it's also then targeting hair follicles because those divide very, very rapidly. And that's why the most common side effect we see is that hair loss in patients. Right. So I want to show you guys that ethos commercial that they really marketed out there. I feel like so these were these ethos loaded commercials that they um, basically put out in the media to try to get parents motivated to vaccinate their kids. I have cervical cancer from an infection, human papillomavirus. Who knew HPV could lead to certain cancers? Who knew my risk for HPV would increase as I got older? Who knew that there was something that could have helped protect me from HPV when I was 11 or 12, way before I would even be exposed to it? Did you know, mom, dad? I was infected with HPV. Maybe my parents didn't know how widespread HPV is. While HPV clears up for most, that wasn't the case for me. Maybe they didn't know I would end up with cancer because of HPV. Maybe if they had known there was a vaccine to help protect me when I was 11 or 12, maybe my parents just didn't know. All right, mom, dad. Okay, so these commercials are filmed from like a post-mortem point of view. So like, it is making you believe that these kids already died and they're like trying to like guilt their parents like I died because you didn't vaccinate me. What? Like that, that blows my mind. Um, and so that was one of the big campaigns that they were rolling because they wanted you guys to get vaccinated. And again, did you guys see how like strategically because they, they're going to put this out in the media and they know that some people are in complete denial that younger generation has premarital sex. And so they are 11 and 12 before I was exposed to it. Never did it say I was sexually transmitted, right? And so this is how they found their way of getting this out in the media. And it would run all of the time. Like you were watching TV and it was like, oh, there's that weird commercial. And typically that's when you change it, you know? Um, now with streaming and everything, like I was telling my kids last period, like I can't remember the last time I watched live TV. I think the only time we watch live TV is when we're on Disney channel and my kids are watching like puppy dog pals or something. Because other than that, like we are, we have like Netflix and Disney plus and all kinds of stuff. And we don't have commercials on any of that. Right. Um, are there any questions for me as far as cancer, cell cycle, any of that yes. is concerned? 